You guys, we have Koi Hagman. You want to make sure that the next time you get on stage, you are going in as prepared as possible. Very highly accomplished IFBB pro coach and educator of bodybuilding and PEDs. Hey, you want to do drugs, that's fine, but you should wait until it's like actually necessary. And frankly, you don't have a lot of room to f around and find out. Most women are competing with shitty hormones. I've seen the cycles that inversely you have the MK and then some blue tide on the same plan. And it's like, what are we doing? Ultimately, if you have someone who has potential risk of cancer. If there's not an indication, I don't think it makes sense to have BPC in place. What are your thoughts on the Ozempic? I wouldn't say it's but I don't feel like it's something I'm strongly a for certain individuals. TRT, as indicated, if your levels are not supported, that's your starting point, is going to cause suppressive effects on all of your hormones. What are the worst things you've seen in coaching? I mean, honestly, I... Th yeah. <laughs> it's, it's definitely EDM. I love it. <laughs> He's going to do so well. I just I can't wait to just witness his world domination. <laughs> <laughs> world domination is right. It's, uh, yeah, that's kind of what he's doing, right? Like, just yeah, something like that. I don't know. It's working, though. I love that. You have, like, I feel like I've only seen you have, like, your professional side. <laughs> this is unhinged. It's from all the travel this month. All the uh, travel this month? Yeah. No, it's uh, becoming less and less polished. Um, so it's nice. good. Um, I'm not going to... Gatorade is fine to have in the frame. I no, absolutely not. Fuck. Okay, I'll just take the label off. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> What's all the traveling for? Um, okay, so I finished school. I like graduated. I still need to take my boards, mm -hmm. but this last month I really had that itch to be like, okay, you've been like tied to LA like, for clinicals and stuff for a while now. Um, and a lot of travel opportunities for like different podcasts, seminars came up. So I was like, okay, yes to everything. So like all of April, I think it was like 10 or 11 trips. Mm -hmm. Um, it was so much, so much fun. It was good, but it was a busy, busy month. Okay. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Well, congrats on that. That's fucking awesome. Thanks. Moving forward in life really quickly. Trying. I don't know. Yeah. Just trying. Try <laughs> I'm becoming more unhinged. Perfect for this podcast. Uh, that's uh, perfect timing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm actually kind of curious, by the way. We could totally bleep this out. But um, how old are you? Uh, I, turned, I turned last week. Okay. Nice. Yeah. How old are you? Uh, it's a secret. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 All right. I, uh, so Google has my age wrong. So I just, it, it has the birthday right, but it has yeah. the age wrong. So Amazing. I just like left it as is. And then one day, one day I like split, spilled something during one of the podcasts and everyone's like, we did the math. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. Great. We'll just keep it to you guys. Okay. That's yeah. intriguing. That's a gatekeeping your age. That's fine. That's, I feel like. That's your thing. Okay. I feel like it's okay. I'm Asian. So I, I was, I didn't know if I could go there. Um, <laughs> it's okay. But for the record, I'm not Asian, but oftentimes that is the assumption. So I was yeah. like, oh, I don't know. What are you? White. Mostly white, <laughs> white, mostly white, a uh, little, little Native American, not enough to get a scholarship or anything. Uh, <laughs> little Spanish, like, yeah, you're okay. European Spanish, um, mostly white. It's very disappointing. People, they, I catfish a lot of people. They think I'm Asian. They're very confused. Like, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't believe you're white. So that's cool though. Yeah. The mixed are the dopest. I think <laughs> that sounds kind of weird. I don't even, I don't even think I count as mixed. It's not enough. Like I, I think People it's just like a little sprinkle, of just like, a, you know, a smidge. A sprinkle of yeah. Okay. People, people who are mixed, be like, you're not. Don't, don't do that. You're not. It's not <laughs> enough. Do you know like the white, uh, like what compromises okay. com is your is your white heritage composed of? Uh, German and Czech. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty white. It's, it's as yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's real white. It kind of undoes the Native American and Spanish. <laughs> yeah. What are I, uh, what are you? I did my 23 and me because I was like kind of curious what everything was because sick. It's I have people some people guess right. I've noticed more people guess right in LA, but normally people just have no clue. Um but uh it wasn't really exciting. Oh. Yeah. A letdown. I am, it was kind of a letdown. Oh. Uh cuz I am uh, I'm like 90% Filipino, like 10% Chinese okay. and um the Filipino part was let, let down because I knew I was Filipino. Both my parents are Filipino. But it's like every Filipino is like there's literally like different subsections of Filipino mm. of the Philippines that are just totally different. And okay. They look totally different. And you can just tell because the Philippines is such a melting pot. So mm. like some people are like super dark skinned and like a lot more like Hispanic in a way. And then some mm. people are like 
lighter skinned and they just look so East Asian. And you just know, you just know that yeah. <laughs> something happened like World War II and someone made my family look a lot more Japanese. So you were hoping, you were hoping for a surprise. My, I think my dad's family seems to resonate a lot with Japanese culture. Mm. And when we were in Japan too, people just, everyone thought my dad was Japanese. So they'd like say konnichiwa to him and everything. So I was like expecting some Japanese in there. And it doesn't say shit. Yeah. So I'm upset. Oh, yeah. oh I'm sorry about that. That had to be hard. <laughs> it was breaking up my reality. <laughs> I would just uh, if I can erase these Japanese characters from my neck. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. No, just cut, just cut some cover ups. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I watch anime, guys. <laughs> Anyways, um, honestly, I mean, I'm I'm just going to start this off. Let's go. We can leave all that in if you want or not. <laughs> it's normally how I roll. Sweet. How do you say your last name, by the way? Hakeman? Hakeman, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, we have Corey Hakeman, the uh, very highly accomplished IFBB pro coach and educator of all things competing, bodybuilding, and PEDs. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, I love how you get into the nitty and gritty of it because I think a lot of people don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people I think, um, tend to stay pretty surface level or I don't know, use the sample size of one is like, okay, this worked for me. I, I feel like, especially when it comes to female PED use, we kind of, we kind of need specifics. We kind of need context. Yeah. Right. I feel like there's even more dark when it comes to the female Um, and I, I think, uh, I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about your content is I feel like you and I are on a very similar path, like what we do. I I like, I like that. That's really cool. Um, like you and I have BB pro and I know that you've competed in a few, uh, how many pro shows? Mm, Five. 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 Okay. And your first one, you got like second place, right? Yeah. That's no. fucking sick. It was so sick. Yeah. I went into that. I was like, I just hopefully first, second call outs, I'll be, I'll be happy. That'll feel great. And then yeah. it was second place and it was um, a one point difference. So, I mean, fuck, I was like, that's a win in my head. That's a win. Mm-hmm. So Yeah. No, that's a yeah. huge win. That is a huge win. That's yeah. literally like my top goal is to do that well at my first pro show, but my first pro show is going to be this year and I'm, uh, I'm taking it as more of like a stepping stone yeah. and me trying to figure out what I need to improve on. Cause I realized like, I don't think I want to like have a two year, three year off season in order to like blow it all out of the water. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You want to make sure that the next time you get on stage, um, you were going in as prepared as possible, not just to see where you stand, but truly you want to be competitive. Is that what you're saying? Mm, yeah. 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 I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, but I, I also enjoy that you uh, kind of just openly, transparently talk about this because I, I think there's a lot of people, especially the ones that are competing in the competing space that don't really talk about this. Like I've heard like some coaches, some older figures talk about this. There's obviously more plates, figure with Steve, mm-hmm. and then some various other coaches that will openly discuss it. But no one really like, I guess, attacks it at its core. And um, I don't think there's as many people that are like really talking about uh the most I see of people that talk about it within our age group and younger and like in Gen Z as well is kind of like a little bit more like glorification on TikTok. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's that one kid. I don't know if his name is David or whatever. That's like, I don't remember his name, but he's like kind of blowing up right now because he just shows like these transformation videos of him. Like he like is small, then he sticks a needle in himself <laughs> and then all of a sudden he's fucking massive. And I'm like, this is terrible. <laughs> You're like, oh no, it's a bad message. Like I get it. You're excited. Yeah, drugs work, but like, oh, it's sending, it's a little aggressive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and like we gotta understand there's all, I mean, I appreciate it. Thank you. There's a lot of people, we got a lot of eyes on us and there's a lot of people who want to get into the sport. Um, but with like bikini, for instance, like it's the lowest barrier to entry. And like now that it's become such uh, an acceptance that like, okay, I can become a IFBB bikini pro. It's not just a matter of like uh, getting to stage, but girls want to be more competitive. And it's kind of become second nature to be like, oh, should I wait to take drugs? Which to me is insane. It's like a lot of these cycles. Like I, I, I knew Okay, so I knew drugs were being misused on the female side of things, like even in bikini. I didn't realize how much they were being misused. I didn't realize how much of a need there actually was uh, from this until I started doing consoles. And I'm like, yo, almost every person I talk with, like there's so few people doing it correctly. Mm. I'm like, yo, like 
y'all are going to be dudes in a few years. Like you are for sure going to virilize. And that's kind of scary when like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I was fortunate. I had people in my corner early on. I mean, bikini was different when I started competing and look was completely different. It wasn't as competitive, but I still had people around me who were like, Hey, you want to do drugs? That's fine. But you should wait generally. Like you should just wait until it's like actually necessary. And I don't feel like right now on the male or female side, that's really being pushed at all. I think it's the opposite. It's like, Oh, whatever it takes, even for bikini, which is insane. Mm hmm. Yeah. What were your assumptions that it would look like before you had all these clients and then now what does it look like to you? I mean, honestly, I thought that a lot of people were really just going to be like, oh, I, I use a little bit of Anivar, maybe use it for too long or use it in the wrong setting, which I mean, that's absolutely happening. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I've seen, I would say, is more prevalent is people combining anabolics using Anvar, Primo, SARMs, and TRT. Like, but TRT, I mean, that's largely, I wouldn't even necessarily say that's from our space, like from bodybuilding coaches, but it's coming from clinics. I mean, like telehealth, it really popped off in 2020. You have all these new businesses, um, you know, just come to light, taking on these online clients or in person clients, um, putting girls on very high dose TRT, which you know, test is virilizing. Like you, the, you need to be careful with that because yeah. I mean, that's one that I mean, frankly, you don't have a lot of room to fuck around and find out. Like you're gonna, mm -hmm. you're gonna experience side effects if uh, you're at a high enough dose, which a lot of girls that I've worked with, um, they've been at doses that is, that are putting them into like the low end of male territory. Ooh, wait, the low end of male territory. Yeah. Do you mind me asking what kind of doses? Yeah. Because yeah, like yeah. I feel like the I feel like mm. you know, female testosterone versus male testosterone is like <laughs> fucking like ten times if not more. Yeah, no, I mean like um I know you, you had Ali Gilbert uh, Ali yeah. on. So I know she talked a little bit about this, like um starting dose for female TRT should be like three and a half, five milligrams. Like five milligrams is still like for most women, that's going to put them on the upper end of mm -hmm. where they should be. But really the threshold, like the cutoff where you're like, hey, we don't want to sit here for any reasonable amount of time is 100 nanograms per deciliter. Now, I have a lot of women that come to me and they're like, oh, I'm at 15 milligrams of test a week. I'm at 20. I'm at 30. I'm at 40. And it's like, that is going to take you to three, four, five hundred yeah. nanograms per deciliter. And I mean, you sit there long enough um, yeah, it's not going to be good. I think a lot of women aren't aware. They just kind of go off symptoms or their providers encourage them to go off symptoms rather than actually looking at lab work and be like, I don't care how good it feels. Like you, unless you're okay with those changes, unless you were like consenting that I'm fine with things changing, but with TRT, that's something you're supposed to be on for life. Like, I mean, it's exogenous support. It's supportive therapy. Mm -hmm. It's not a cycle, you know, yeah. so it, treating it like a cycle of like Anavar that is then going to be in place indefinitely. It's just it's a bad recipe. Right. Exactly. These things are slowly changing and we can't really tell. Um, I guess the only few times where you can really tell is like if you're a guy, for example, and you're feeling the, the guy to come ask you, come on. But I mean, does that happen often for women? Can they feel that? They can feel they can feel uh they can feel things changing. Yeah. I mean, like, so the two bigger side effects that I think women need to be aware of, um, the signs of virilization. So virilization, those androgenic effects, um, voice deepening. So the thickening of vocal cords, which typically will happen very gradually. Mm -hmm. The other change is localized anatomical changes. So like clitoral growth. And yeah. I mean, that's something like technically right. you're going to feel, and that's not going to be very comfortable. I think that'd be the most equivalent to gyno. Um, but mm -hmm. even then I think it's something that's going to be really hard for, uh, an a female athlete to take a step back and be like, okay, but that's, that's going to go away. Right. That's, that's just temporary. That's not really something. I think a lot of coaches are like warning them like, Hey, you, we, we got to keep a check. We got to keep checking on this. Like that should not be happening. Like it's not the cost of doing business. Like, yeah, use, use drugs, but like to what extent, like you shouldn't have to compromise your femininity just yeah. to be enhanced. Right. Um, and I guess, I guess what my question was, uh, is I guess they can tell the difference from like a before and after. Right. But do they feel like some kind of like stimulation, like someone does whenever they're actually, whenever gynecomastia is actually incurring? 
like for guys i guess they feel like a huge like sensitivity in their nipples so that's like a symptom that yeah. they can help like you know help some yeah. like, oh shit you know um yeah i mean like you're gonna you're gonna feel those anatomical changes like that's gonna be something that i would say is equivalent to someone experiencing okay. gyno um that gosh i had i did have someone who came to me she was on a lot of drugs she was on 50 milligrams of anavar mm -hmm. she went to the er yeah, because she was in a lot of pain she, she was in a lot of pain down oh, there and i was like shit. um i mean yeah like she said it exploded. I'm like, that's, oh. I'm like, that's it. Sorry. I, I, we're diving in, I guess, like really abruptly. So for viewers and listeners, uh, yeah, that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, oh. that seems like the outlier that, that yeah. doesn't seem like a standard across the board. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of actually feeling like vocal changes, I think that's going to be something that's much harder for someone to catch in themselves unless they are tracking like their actual pitch. Like I have clients track, uh, using like a voice analyzer app. So it'll mm. track like, where do you sit normally? And that's something we would start prior to them using any kind of enhancements. Um, mm. okay. Your bass. Like, so if you're someone who has a really like sing songy voice, maybe you have a lot of runway where if that changes, like it's okay, it's going to get a little bit lower, a little bit lower. But if you're starting, if you've a woman who let's say, already has a deeper voice or naturally like she just has high free test. Maybe she has PCOS. Okay. Well her runway for experiencing those androgenic effects is going to be much lower. So, I mean, it's a consideration to make, um, I don't know from an actual sensation standpoint, if they would actually feel a difference in that regard. Okay. That's really cool though that you have that app. That's neat. It's, yeah. I feel like yeah, yeah. I don't even, I don't think I've ever heard of that before. So I feel like there can't be that many coaches that are utilizing that probably not no um i mean so I, I do work with male clients too and like on the gyno for instance i tell them like yo like you as a guy like you probably haven't experienced nipple sensitivity in your life you're gonna know that's not gonna be something like you just ignore un unless like you really really are good at that and you're just committed to going through your cycle but any kind of change in that regard for men i mean like you do want to pick up on it and you want to address it as soon as possible because otherwise you're going to have to address it at some point and your options are going to be limited yeah right no one really wants to pay for surgery yet especially after they've already experienced having a lot of gynecomastia no no uh, not at all real quick guys so while i was looking at the youtube analytics i actually saw that 85 percent of you guys that watch this channel are not subscribed and i want to ask very little of you guys but if you enjoy this podcast if you find value in it then please do me this one favor and subscribe to the channel because doing so helps me get bigger and greater guests like the guests you are listening to today. Also, this channel is not sponsored, which means only the companies that I work with, which are Young Elaine Huge Supplements, are the companies that can help fund this channel by you guys using the code Nile. So Code Nile gives you a discount of 15% off of Young LA, and Code Nile also gives you a, a discount of 10% off of Huge Supplements. And if you decide to purchase anything from any of these companies, it will help immensely for me by using my code. And this way, I can travel to other guests, such as Dr. Mike Israel next week, and also upgrade an equipment to make this podcast bigger and better for you guys. Uh, for women, what would you say is like a dose of Anavar that you believe is uh, safest for someone to start if they're conscious and mindful of their, I guess, health and long longevity? Longe yeah. So, I mean, I'm a big, no, you got it. It's okay. Words are hard right now. Fuck. Um, two and a half milligrams uh, a day. I mean, two and a half. And I mean, like if you're someone who's in, and I'm, I'm talking like, I guess it's important to clarify. A lot of the women I work with um, are very risk averse. So, I mean, mm -hmm. they come to me, they're like, hey, I, I would like no negative, no unwanted effects. I don't want to sacrifice any of that. Mm -hmm. um, now that has to be considered relative to the division that they're competing in. You take someone who's in wellness, who's in figure, women's physique, the minimum buy-in is several cycles and an and, and extensive I guess, career of PED use. So with that in mind, I mean, even an athlete who wants to compete in those divisions that have a higher muscularity requirement, still going to be like, okay, if we're going to do this in the safest way possible, we should start at the lowest dose possible to yield the results that we're looking for. So we're trying to build muscle. Okay. Put Anavar in place. If I have someone who's never used Anavar, 
you know, in, in their life. Okay. Two and a half milligrams. Fine. Okay. If you can't source it, if you use five milligrams, fine. Um, but it still comes down to the total lifetime exposure, the dose and the duration. If we're going to use, let's say seven and a half or 10 milligrams for a shorter duration. Okay. Maybe there's an argument there, but if we have someone who's going to be using, um, let's say Anavar for eight, maybe even 12 weeks, I'm going to, I'm going to err on the side of let, let's l- use that lower dose. This might be a little weird question. I mean, but. yeah, we just talked about like clitoral enlargement, so I don't think it gets weirder than that. I mean, <laughs> by all means. <laughs> um, I guess I like to uh, dive deep into because I, I don't re- I really have experience with, um, I guess, bodybuilding for women. So I'm always curious. Just I, uh, you you hear like it's hard to tell. I guess how many people in the pro stage might be actually using, and I would assume probably a majority, if not almost all since it's it's untested right but um yeah i guess based off of your clientele like what have you seen um so at the pro level like specific to bikini i mean i, I do think there is a lot of use um a lot of misuse mm-hmm. a lot of drugs used to compensate for either poor programming uh poor timelines or or just simply being impatient um do I think that there are bikini pros who don't use drugs? Yeah. Yeah. There's some, um, when we're talking about the highest level though, I mean like in all divisions, you have people who are doing to do whatever it takes. And Mm -hmm. I think it's a very, um, daunting reality that, you know, amateurs, they are just newer competitors need to accept. Is that like, you can't really determine if someone's using drugs, even just looking at them. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who use drugs. They look like shit. Like they, they don't look good. Um, ideally you're using drugs that augment everything else that you're already doing. I mean, they're only going to help a process that's already occurring. They're Mm -hmm. not going to force you to build muscle if you're doing all of these things wrong. So it's like put them in place when they make the most sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, This might be also a little bit difficult because I think this varies per person and per situation. But when do you feel like it is sensible for someone to finally start using PDs? Because I get this question count like just countless times. um, And something that I want to, I think, press is um, obviously PDs are becoming like a lot more um, of an like an open subject. But uh, I think there's still such a negative connotation where... um, People are afraid to talk about it, but because I have discussed it and because there's also another side of this industry where there's people that are glorifying the use of steroids or they just at least bring it up, but don't discuss all the things that they actually experience or what they have to go through or a lot of these important markers that they have to be conscious about. Um, I've had kids, like I've had a lot of kids actually come up to me in person, like at Zoo Culture and other gyms, um, just at random gyms. And they'll just be asking me about steroids and be like, should I start steroids? Like I want to start, like my friend told me I should, or my friend told me to start MK because literally he doesn't feel any, ex- any side effects except for the hunger, which I'm like, you know, in my head, I'm like, that's fucking false. <laughs> that's cap. But, um, or, you know, because they saw like this kid's reel that's on TikTok where he's like transforming because he's sticking himself with a needle. And I, uh, Man, I think it's rough because like when I first started using PEDs, it was off of, I didn't know anything. It was super ignorant. Um, I tried to, uh, I wanted to get into bodybuilding without using PEDs whatsoever. Like I loved bodybuilding, but I just knew that I would never take steroids, at least at the time. And so when Men's Physique came out like 2013, I was like, dude, this is my chance. Like, I, I fucking love this. Like, this is awesome. I want to do this. So that was my goal. And I so, so I competed in like five, six shows naturally. But, um, you know, by the time I was going to nationals, I was getting 16 plus place because all these guys are jacked out of their minds. They're huge. I'm They're so big. little tiny Asian natural guy that was only good at math in school. Oh, my God. So <laughs> at one point, I think my, uh, my coach just started pushing certain substances um and i would always say no like i would say say no to steroids but then he started saying like hey this is an ai it's not a steroid uh so it's it's going to make you look drier before stage Mm. and obviously i'm assuming this is because my estrogen would be lower and that was his like intention of putting me on an ai even though i'm not taking anything else even though your estrogen is already probably shitty even though it's probably (laughs) already completely (laughs) smashed down it's like let's smash it down further like below threshold. sure yeah 
So, um, yeah, started taking that for one of the shows. I was a little bit drier, but obviously, like, <laughs> at what cost? And then after that, um, I took some other pills from him. One of them ended up being Halo Tustin. Oh, and um, okay. I think, uh, I don't know, I think I was just so depressed from not getting the placement I want because literally my entire dream was, like, getting my pro card at the time. Like, I was in college, and I, I like, literally, the engineering degree was absolutely secondary to me getting my pro card that was mm. number one like showing my parents like hey i can do what i want to do so i just took the pills from him and then like literally like maybe like a week into it i told my friend and he's like dude that's like that's a fucking strong ass steroid and i'm like what are you serious it's a steroid yeah <laughs> and that's it and then i was like well um i already like popped my cherry so yeah might as well you kind of you're like okay, well I, I crossed the the threshold even without realizing right. it. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean. Um, and then having a huge mm-hmm. fear of needles, I was like, well, I guess I don't have to stick myself, so I might as well keep going. Do you do you still have a fear of needles? Or are you still like not a fan of needles? Um, you know the craziest thing is it was like a phobia, kind of like how I'm like I'm very scared of heights, okay. and I try to get over it by putting myself in roller coasters. Mm-hmm. Still can't skydive. Um, but uh, I think I have overcome my fear of needles okay. drastically. So, yeah. Um, considering the amount of tattoos and piercings and um, the fact that I'm bodybuilding consistently for several years. Yeah. I mean, for sure. um, so my tattoo artist, one of, one of my tattoo artists, um, he is outsourcing his BPC injections to me because he doesn't want to inject. He's a tattoo artist. He's fully like tatted. I'm like... Do we see the irony here? <laughs> he's like, yeah, I just, the needle is like, it's a bit much. Wait, of- wait, he said he wants to. Wait. So he has some um, arthritis in his wrist uh-huh. and he's using BPC um, just to, the BPC is good for avascular um, injuries. So he's like, yeah, I like I told him about it. We're literally when he's doing my tattoos and he's like, wait, so I would have to inject. I'm like, yeah. He's like, it's a little bit of a hurdle for me. I'm like. Are you serious? Damn. I was, like, I was and he was down in Venice. That's where I'm at. And he's like, yeah. would you do it for me? Could I like pay you to be like a drop in nurse? I'm like, <laughs> are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like, so th- but it's, it's subcutaneous. I mean, like yeah. in, even on that, in that regard, I mean like, um, some of the men I work with, that's been a hurdle that we've kind of had to mm-hmm. overcome too. They're like, I, I don't want to inject. I'm bought into what you're saying. But like, like, how can we work around this? And like, I mean, going from like intramuscular to subcutaneous, I think for a lot of people that can... Or vice versa? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, like if you're talking about um, IM, like, I mean, you're talking about a needle, like it's like 10 millimeters, like in length and like, I mean, 28 gauge. So it's like, it's thicker. It's more uncomfortable mm-hmm. as opposed to like a sub-Q, uh, subcutaneous injection. Mm-hmm. It's much more manageable, um, which can, can be helpful for like... Which one's more manageable? Subcutaneous. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're on the same page. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm glad to hear, I'm glad to hear you're not, uh, on like an oral only cycle. We were, I was like, I'm like Oh yeah. What? No, like, that was a, I figured on. that out like a long time ago, like, which is a good thing. <laughs> but, um, before we move on though, okay. I'm fucking curious. Okay. So this isn't the, this guy can't have injected himself ever before then if, if that's how he feels. No, okay. no. Big, big fan of needles, like in, in the tattoo space, but he's yeah. like, oof. Right. An injection. That's just, I'm not, I don't want to do that. Can you do it for me? I'm like, yeah, I did it once and told him to figure it out. And I was like, no, you're going to learn yeah. how to do this. Like it's, it's a, uh, sometimes we feel like it's so scary, but it's literally a hundred percent in our minds. That's the scariest part is like, we like the, our fantasies of what we, what we fear is always, um, oh, what is the term? There was a saying that I fucking love. It's like, uh, well I, well, I forgot, but it's not as bad as we think it is, you know, no, no, it's not no, as bad as yeah. we fear. So, and then as you consistently keep doing it, I feel like we build like this tolerance in our brain. Like the thought still is worse than it is, but it's just not physically nearly ever as bad. And, um, I like, I had like the biggest fear. Like I really didn't want to do it because I just, the thought of a needle entering my skin or entering mm-hmm. my body was very repulsive to me. It wasn't really like thinking of the pain that I would feel. It was yeah. more of like, this feels like, obviously like this shouldn't happen. This isn't something I should do. Like maybe I should protect my body from this. Yeah. But then you do it so many times and I think uh, your body just realizes and learns that like it literally isn't. It, it doesn't matter. It's, so yeah, it's, it's okay. It can be okay. I mm-hmm. mean like, um, it definitely practices with like 
injections for sure. But uh, I guess there there are better ways to go about it. But um, I would say that's a very healthy aversion. Um, but within our sport, that's definitely a predicament in your in your case, like I mean, per your division, uh, per the division's needs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I actually got my um, I did I got my first phlebotomy. I think like maybe a few days ago, maybe okay. last week. And that was probably the scariest thing I think for me was like, cause, um, I can inject without any, any issues now. Mm-hmm. Right. Like honestly, I kind of in a weird way enjoy it. Um, <laughs> but the thought of getting my blood work done is always like weird to me. I just don't like the thought of like the nurse sticking the needle in my vein and then sucking out my blood. I don't, I don't like the yeah. thought of it, even though sometimes it, you don't, you hardly even feel it at all as long as she sticks it in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, then the phlebotomy fun. scared me because I'm like, my doctor's like, yeah, you'll you'll need to be here for like two to three hours. And I'm like, wow, that thing is going to be stuck in me, sucking on my blood for two to three hours. I got in there and literally before I like knew it, it was over. And I literally feel like I didn't feel anything. And then they started putting in the fluids. And I was like, wow, that was like probably the easiest experience. So. And now I, I think what you were... Um like what you're t- touching on to build off of that from earlier, um, you fight hard enough for your limits, you get to keep them. So, I mean, like it is self-created. And I mean, I think we see that a lot too with contest prep. People have this idea around like um, the suck that comes with like being hungry, like being really, really lean and like kind of being stuck in that state. And it's like mm-hmm. once you're through it, like when, once you're post-show and off season, like your brain isn't going to let you conjure up how bad it actually was. It's not going to recreate that feeling because it's going to protect you. Like your brain is designed to do that you're going to forget, like you're, you're just going to remember it sucked. But like, I mean, actually going through it, like you just got to go through it. Like you just got to, just got to get through that feeling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I guess what my thought was, you know, cause I went on this long tangent of like what I did. Um, I did oral only cycle, got my pro card. Obviously after that, didn't know what I was doing, stopped working with my coach. And so I just had depressed testosterone and was depressed for like a good year trying to figure it out. I uh, even like once I realized that, oh, wait, maybe it is actually just my testosterone. Like I uh, I uh, ordered some HCG and I tried to come back. I tried to even u- utilize carnivore diet because I thought eating more fats was going to help my testosterone increase. But it didn't work in the way that I had hoped. Um, and so the whole process was a very miserable experience, like an incredibly miserable experience. I had two of my closest best friends. Um, they were both female, so I don't know how much they could relate I was assuming maybe because they experience hormone fluctuations, maybe they could relate to a level, but instead literally my friend was just like, I think you really need to like, you know, work on your mental health. I think you should go to like <laughs> therapy or something. And dude, that fucking, oh man, I blew the fuck up. But, um, after that, you know, I realized like, this is something that's important to me. Like, I don't want other people to have to go through this process. And I feel like there's a lot of kids these days that are coming up to me that know nothing about gear that are ready to start today. And so I guess my question for you is like, when do you think is it is finally sensible um, in bodybuilding for someone to start PEDs? For me, I really want to see that someone understands everything outside of the drugs. Like, are, are you willing and are you capable of doing what it takes? And I mean, like, I know it sounds really cliche. Um, can, can you do what it takes because of the drugs? That's the easiest part. I mean, that's the part. And if that's the only part that they're willing to do, I mean, like, I, I coach, but I'm like, I'm not going to force myself to work with someone who frankly is, is lazy, like who can't do the diet, can't do the training, um, who can't even be consistent, like on the recovery side and mm-hmm. specifically, uh, for female athletes. I'm like, yo, like you can't come to me and tell me that you don't want to incur any unwanted effects yet when we lay that, like when I lay out, okay, here's what needs to happen. I need to see that you're able to stay consistent on plan. I need to see that, um, you're still able to actually yield progress without the drugs. If you're not willing to do that, then like, why, why are drugs even a part of the equation? So I I mean, to answer your question, when is it appropriate? Well, I think the first thing that has to be established is there a need per the division for bikini. You can go pretty far depending on what your aspirations are. You can go pretty far without drugs. Anything above that? Yeah. Like, I mean, the minimum buy-in, if you're talking about wellness, like that is an unnaturally dense 
look that they're trying Mm -hmm. to achieve. It's not to say that you must have them in place, but that threshold is going to be earlier on in their career than let's say a bikini competitor Mm -hmm. on the male side of things. I really do have a lot of compassion for like male competitors because even in men's physique, you're talking about a division that has an immense amount of muscle, even at the regional level. So, I mean, for one ensuring, okay, in men and women, um, Hormonally, are you in a place to support taking these drugs in a way that the drugs are not going to inhibit your efforts? So, for instance, you have a guy who comes to you is like, hey, I don't want to inject. I'm young. Um, I'd like to be a competitive men's physique athlete at the regional level. Okay, so there's some gaps already in this. Like, he's not a pro. You don't have that. Like, it's easy when someone's like a pro and they're like, okay, I'm ready to take it to the next level. And they have a lot of potential. Cool. In that case, we can make that argument uh, pretty uh, seamlessly. Where are the hormones at to begin with? Um, do you have supportive therapy in place? So it's kind of the same thing for females as it is for men. You need to have a test. You need to have test as your base. And if that's not in place, any kind of anabolics, they're going to have suppressive effects on the HBO access for females, um, for men, you, you are going to have suppressive effects on your test. That's going to be an issue. So rather than just do the quick cycle and like, Oh, we're just going to have this in during prep. It's like, are you committed to go down this path? Cause that path involves supportive therapy. It involves that TRT, at least on in some level, mm-hmm. um, to prevent you being in that suppressed state. I think that needs to be addressed off the rip, um, for mm-hmm. men and women, yeah. uh, on the female side, the non androgenic PEDs, we should lean on those first. And let's say we incorporate those in some capacity that makes sense. So, you know, in a fat loss phase, we're putting in things that are going to help facilitate that process. Uh, in a building phase, we're putting in things that are going to help you grow. That for me is a little bit of a trial period to see, okay, again, can this person be consistent with everything else that they need to do? Because if they can't, I have no reason to enable because that, that's how I see it. Even if they accept the risk, they could change their mind. They could look back and be like, well, I kind of wish Corey had been a little more conservative. And at the end of the day, mm-hmm. even though they're, you're, these are adults, they can make their own decision. I'm not liable in that sense. This is not medical advice. It's literally just, hey, like this is hypothetically what I would do. I'm still a part of that behavior. I'm still encouraging it in some transient fashion. So mm-hmm. it's like, do I trust that this person isn't going to have regrets about how we did this? Would I have wanted someone to take the same care if this was me as an athlete? Um, That's how I try to approach it is just considering, okay, what is this person getting out of using these drugs? Is it worth the risk? Mm -hmm. What have you seen in terms of like variance and emotional stability among like your clients? If they, I guess, have taken PEDs. Mm. In what regard? So I, I guess, let me ask this. Do you mean the PED is actually causing variations in, in their emotions? Or do you mean like their, um, I guess, yeah. What do you mean by that? I'll just, <laughs> just. Uh, so I guess I know that a, a lot of people can, I mean, obviously this varies per person. Um, but I understand that like in a competition, um, in any of those settings, normally, even if you're natural, you know, you're going to have an, a fluctuation of your hormones and you're probably not going to feel very good towards the end. But um, on the guy's side, depending on what PEDs you take and noticeably seemingly for guys that are below the age of 25 more than not, it seems like uh, it causes a lot of um, emotional fluctuations as well as like slight changes in personality. And I think that's really important that a lot of um, younger people don't really think about or they're not too mindful of when they think about jumping on steroids or taking any of these things so i guess just from the woman's side because i know especially you focus on being a lot more moderate or a lot more mild which i think is fucking super important but what have you seen in terms of like emotional changes or instability from i guess women taking pds or anyone taking pds yeah um so i'm of the belief it's not going to alter who you are. If you're Mm -hmm. someone who is more sensitive and emotionally heightened, you have a propensity to um, be very reactive. I think PEDs are going to enhance that. They're going to exacerbate something that's already there. So when you look at someone, male or female, who is 
in a younger demographic, they're not as emotionally mature. And I mean, like that, that's just fact. I mean, like for some people, they don't hit a point where, uh, their decision-making is, is logic based until, you know, maybe later in their twenties, even in their thirties. It's not to say that you can't take PEDs or there's not a good argument for you to take PEDs, but be very cognizant of your own tendencies prior to using PEDs. Um, obviously doing self-work and, you know, trying to at least mitigate, um, if, if you're someone who's a little more explosive, if you're going to be using compounds that enhance that, like, incredibly, um, knowing like, okay, this is going to pose a problem down the road if I'm going to mm-hmm. continue to use something like, let's say trend. Okay. Well, yeah, if you're going to be using that regularly, uh, you were exposing yourself to an even more volatile state. Mm-hmm. I'd be aware of it, but at the end of the day, like it, I don't think it's going to alter who someone is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that. Um, I think it's very hard. Uh, this is a thought that I've only had really recently because uh, I think I've been trying to be a little bit more empathetic for the people that are going through this. But I think there's a lot of people. Um, I mean, this happens at any age, but there are a lot of people that tend to not be as aware of like what mm-hmm. kind of um, maybe person they are or how reactive they are or how emotional they are. Sometimes it's hard to compare, you know, um, and uh, unless you have like a third person perspective that you can generally trust with like good criticism so i've noticed that i've had one friend that came on a podcast that seemed to take almost everything under the sun for a prep um looked crazy and he had no issues whatsoever it was like the same person felt amazing throughout the entire process whereas uh, i had another friend that came on and a couple other friends that also had similar experiences where they took maybe a little bit less than that person. They still took like an assortment of things and trend was obviously still included and man, it wrecked their mental health, um, changed how they reacted to things. Uh, and honestly just was probably the least conducive thing to like their, just their like lifestyle, their health and their happiness. So the crazy thing there is like, man, it's like, how do you know when you, before going to this, how do you know that this is something that you'd be susceptible to? Like, how do you know? And I think that's just hard. That's just something people should think about. Totally, totally. Um, I think it's important to know your own behaviors and recognizing those patterns. Um, It can be hard if you don't want to admit it. Like, I mean, it, it comes down to, can you be honest with yourself about, um, those behaviors and, how much control you actually have over them. I I think that's very tough to swallow. And a lot of people would love if they didn't have control over it so they could assign blame somewhere else. Because if you have control over it, I mean, you also have control to change it. It puts a lot of responsibility, uh, a lot of responsibility on the individual. I am a big proponent of like just full ownership of, of every, I mean, it's really the only thing that you can control your behaviors and your opinions. Um, for me, like I I know tendencies that I have, um, at different points. So, I mean, like if I'm in a state, let's say where I know I'm spread really thin, um, discipline and just the ability to pause if that is exhausted and I'm in a contest prep. Okay. Well, with drugs aside, I just know that I have this, constant baseline of a stressor that's going to be in place from contest prep. Well, if I'm also in a state, let's say with like school or I'm in a, I don't know, a really challenging relationship. It's like, well, I'm not setting myself up for success. And I would look Mm -hmm. at it almost the same way as like, okay, are you managing fatigue to fatigue of all sorts? So allostatic load, like perceived and real stressors. Are you managing that in a way going into, let's say taking a trend cycle, which let's just agree that like, okay, you have to do it. Okay. You have to do it because it's what you need to be competitive. Fine. I'm not saying you have to, and I'm sure someone would love to clip that, but it's honestly, it's <laughs> just like, if that's a part of your protocol, um, taking measures beforehand to ensure that you've done everything to manage stress. If you're in a relationship and you know, like, Hey, uh, baseline, I'm very reactive, but I'm going to be introducing this drug that's going to cause me to be even more reactive. It sounds great in theory, but I mean, I would recommend like having that conversation with your loved one, like your girlfriend be like, Hey, um, this is going to be a long stretch. I'm going to probably be more sensitive. What kind of, um, 
what kind of strategies, what kind of interventions can we have in place when I'm feeling spread thin so that these um, instances where I would react and things would get really crazy, what can we do to avoid that or at least manage it if it does start to get heated? Yeah, that's cool. I think awareness is key. It's probably number one. Uh, and that doesn't happen often. <laughs> it's hard. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to realize like how oh, I'm, I'm kind of the reason for this. Uh, yeah. I, and it doesn't feel good to take a pause. I mean, like if, I mean, in any kind of setting, if, um, you believe what you're feeling to be fact and you feel entitled to feel what you're feeling and, and you believe there's truth in it, it's like to take a step back and be like, Oh, I, maybe I'm not reacting the way I want to. I think that takes a lot of self-awareness and maybe it's too much to ask of someone in, in that case, I'd be like, Hey, if, if you don't have the capability to do that, maybe you're not ready to introduce some of these drugs that will in a way override or, or at least make it more difficult to pause. Um, I just want to backtrack a little bit cause I actually didn't even ask, ask this, but, uh, what could you start into this whole thing? Like when, what's your earliest memory you can think of? Uh, like I just got, got you interested in doing bodybuilding, comp- competing, talking about this. Um, so my mom, she started a weight loss challenge when I was in high school. So this Mm. was 2009, 2010, and she had my fitness pal out. And like, I remember came home from school. Um, I was in sports in high school. I mean, played sports year round. I watched, uh, volleyball, soccer, track, cross country. So, I mean, it was, I I, I liked, I wasn't very good. Like I was, I I liked (laughs) working out. I liked weightlifting. I swear. I mean, that was like. 80% 80% of it. But, um, yeah, she told me, she was like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to lose some weight. Like they're doing this thing. You want a prize if you like lose the most weight relative. And, um, she was like, I'm going to start tracking calories. And I was like, Oh, cool. So I like downloaded it too. And it, it was just her and I growing up. So I was like, okay, like now I'm going to start tracking just to like help support her. Um, but I mean, like I was telling someone recently, I was like, yeah, no, I was tracking macros like in high school. Like I just was, oh, this is a way to kind of manipulate uh, calorie intake. I mean, I didn't really do it correctly at the time, but that was probably my earliest exposure to it. Um, in college, bikini was becoming a thing. So 2013, 2014. Mm. Um, and I saw these girls, I was like, damn, like they, they look great. It's like the Victoria's Secret model, but with like curves and like I mean like good curves like they look very sporty and at the time I was like that'd be really cool to look that way so I was like um I understood energy balance I understood the training side of things so I started getting ready for my first show I prepped myself um so I did two shows back to back it did pretty well and um then I got into powerlifting after that because like fuck I'm so small I like, <laughs> ah, just I want to take drugs but I guess I'll just powerlift instead <laughs> like <laughs> It was the gym bro cycle. Exactly, exactly. Um, but it was it was good. I mean, um, I loved the process of mm-hmm. bodybuilding. And I think like, many female listeners, I, I don't know, like 5% female listener audience. <laughs> okay. We want to talk about it. Okay. So for them, yeah. I mean, like a lot of a lot of people, men and women, we struggle with like on the male side, you struggle with wanting to look differently than you do. You want to be bigger. You want to be leaner. So it's like I saw bodybuilding as a way to at least like uh, – be autonomous and take ownership of, of that. Um, Mm -hmm. and I thought the process was really cool to not have to like wake up and be like, Oh, I fucking hate my body. I can, Oh, I can do something about this. Like I can actually work towards this every day and Mm -hmm. build it exactly how I want. That's sick. So, um, yeah, that's really the inception. Do you feel like you had a very competitive mindset all through like doing sports in high school? Very, very competitive, but I mean, um, not necessarily on the team sport aspect, but I just competitive with myself. Uh-huh. Like, I mean, I, I liked, um, I liked beating like last, last performances. So I mean like same thing in the sport of bodybuilding. Um, it's more to me about like beating the last package I had, not necessarily okay, like placing a lot of it's out of your control. Um, but if I look better than I did previously, I mean, I obviously I want to win and mm-hmm. I want that to be reflected in my competitive career. But at the end of the day, like that is out of your hands. And I mean, mm-hmm. like a lot of these divisions, they're very subjective. So it's like you show up the best prepared that you can and hopefully that translates. And if it doesn't, I mean, fuck it. Like, what are we talking about? We're talking about getting on stage, asking people to pick our body apart. Like it's <laughs> so silly. Like it's a very silly sport. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, for me, it's always been like, what, uh, how, how far can I push myself? And mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like that to me is much more rewarding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Um, when did you do those two competitions? 
2015. Okay. Same year as my first two competitions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Also in college, exact same situation. Came off of sports through high school and I was like, all I want to do is lift, you know. And um, saw men's physique and I was like, damn, I just want to look like those guys. Look fucking sick. So same process. And I think um, the competitiveness in me, but I think also wanting some kind of structure and some wanting something to show for it because... Uh, I started lifting when I was 12 and I felt like it was like my thing. My parents wanted to put me in all these, an assortment of things, including being a doctor, being an engineer, you know, and um, I just didn't feel like that really resonated with me that much. Like, yeah, I like to play Legos and play with Bionicles when I was a kid, but I don't think that really translated enough to <laughs> being an engineer. <laughs> no, um, no, I feel you. So, yeah, this was like my thing. And then I think I realized just competing gave me like that outlet for me to like really integrate this into something substantial and something that I could like prove was like, this is my like art. Like, and I have like, like I have milestones I can reach. Yeah. You know, it's not a matter of just like, um, I I don't know, just winning a competition, but like it's never ending. And I mean, I, I think the cool part about it is like you get to a certain point and like, even if you don't necessarily fit within the criteria, it's still like, okay, do you have the body you like? Mm -hmm. And, I think for a lot of people, they get wrapped up into like, okay, but does this translate on stage to what I want? It's like, sure. But I think you also have to consider like, you have to live in that body the other days of the year. And like, are you happy? Are you going to be happy at your heaviest? Like you're not going to walk around stage lane. (laughs) So is it the body that you want? I mean, like I, yeah, I mean, like I I think it's, uh, it's definitely a long play and it's something that like Mm -hmm. has given me, uh, uh, a lot of control over, I guess, my perception of my body. And I would say definitely helped me in terms of like using lifting and using just like being generally like mindful of my diet. And that's something I would do whether I was in the sport or not. Like I like the process of it, but it's nice that, okay, putting as much time as I do into those avenues, then I also have this sport that I can be like, okay, let's do something with this. I think the only thing that I've noticed from what I've done is that like staying shredded for three years will get you like some more Instagram engagement while as um, at least going through the normal bodybuilding cycles will get you um, a level of fulfillment from seeing yourself improve because I don't think I, I don't think I got the same level of fulfillment from seeing my the number of followers I had rise versus at least just seeing some progress in my physique. So, yeah, I think um a lot of the growth, I mean, metaphorically, but also physically is going to happen when you're off stage. It's a big message I try to push for women is like, mm-hmm. I get it. Like it, it, yeah, it's a bikini and I know it's, we have like 85 shows a year. So it's like, you want to get on stage. Cool. You have the ability to, but for me, it's always come down to, I don't want to look the exact same way. Like mm-hmm. I want there to be a notable improvement. Mm-hmm. And if there's not, I'm like, why did I just do this? Like why, why did I say, and then that's defeating when you've taken like a long time off yeah. stage and you get back on, you're like, I really didn't build as much as I thought I did. Like, I mean, that's, yeah. uh, it's not a good feeling. It's a scary thought. Yeah. It's scary terrifying. Thought. I've been looking at myself too. Like this is the very first like real bulk under like a bodybuilding, like a, a pro program that I've ever done. So I've never really done bulking with the use of PEDs exactly. Um, Cause I just try to stay shredded for social media for a good amount of time. So, I mean, this year has been a really cool experience cause I, I think my maintenance calories seem to jump like at least a thousand calories and um, eating so much more food, definitely gain a lot more size, I think, and some strength. But like looking at like the moment that you start turning the dial and cutting instead of bulking and then you just see yourself get flat, but you still have all the fat, the flap of fat stage. And it's just like, Mm -hmm. like, did I even gain any mass? Like, did I even it's like I'm in this place where it's hard for me to even tell right now. Um, And I guess, you know, all I need to do is wait, you know, be patient and see how it goes. But I think um, I think. I think that's like why it's really nice to have a knowledgeable coach is like sometimes I don't know if I push hard enough or sometimes I don't know if I push the calories hard enough or maybe maybe I push something else too hard, you know? Yeah, totally. I think um, the hardest part about what you're describing, like going through your first structured, like intentional growth phase um, for one 
you're not going to get the same dopamine response that you would in a fat loss phase. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, like week to week, like you see, even if it's like half a pound, a pound, you're like sick. I did the thing. Like I did what I was trying to do. Cool. Yeah. In a growth phase, it's like, no, not only am I, I'm going the opposite direction. I'm, I'm getting fatter or, I mean, the best case scenario is I'm not getting fatter. Sweet. That was a good week. How does this work? Like mentally, that's really tough. Mm-hmm. You rely on training performance. Sure. But at a certain point, I mean, like you were fighting for any kind of incremental progress for like the load you're lifting. Cool. Um, I think using other metrics to, to track, okay, like is, is the body composition moving in the right direction? So like circumference, like taking your measurements, it's a really, I'm a really big fan of that alongside uh, skin fold sites. So that was a big game changer for me in my mm. intentional push phase. It was like, I'm going to use <clears throat> like how people would go get like caliper readings at a gym. I, I'm just going to do it myself. I'm going to pinch, like I'm going to measure in millimeters, like fattest body parts, leanest body parts. And then eventually I'm going to collect so much data that next time I compete, I can at least compare what is the circumference compared mm. to the pinchable fat. And I went through a prep using these tools to see as I got leaner. Okay, cool. So I have that baseline data. I went through an intentional growth phase. And then following that, I went through an intentional fat loss phase. And I'm like, yo, like I'm not far from a body fat standpoint from where I was when I competed last, but the the circumference, like the width of of these body parts that I wanted to grow, they've definitely improved. For me, that alongside scale weight and pictures, at least for the mental yeah. side, it helps so much. Yeah, that's amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I literally, uh, I'm gonna admit, I've never done that ever, and I think that's honestly perfect to have the circumference and the the skin fold at the time of like your prep, like knowing how much fat, or at least an approximation of how much fat you have on your body compared to like the circumference of what you're trying to grow is like, it's kind of obvious. I don't know why I never did that to be honest. No, I mean, it's, I, I don't think a lot of people do. I, I think for me, I wanted the whole idea of like, okay, just look at pictures and look at scale weight. It's like, we're talking about like, for me, I, when I was trying to grow and in, intentionally, I'm like, a quarter of a pound every two weeks, like that's nothing. And that's going to fluctuate already just from like hormonal changes. So having something outside of that to rely on and be like, okay, we're moving in the right direction. Cool. Like I just need some kind of reassurance. Mm -hmm. Um, I find for a lot of clients too, when they go through their first growth phase, they're like, listen, Corey, like I, I get it. I know it can be done. I just, I haven't done it. So I don't believe it as like that belief isn't as strong. And I think you don't really get that until you cut down again, until you get to your leanest. Cause then you're like, okay, yeah, more muscle confirmed after that. It gets easier. It's just that first one. I mean, it mm-hmm. really takes a lot of blind faith. So how long do you think you would, uh, or how long do you normally recommend, um, say one of your female athletes to bulk? It really depends on the runway. Mm-hmm. So for me, I know the body weight that I'm like, okay, past this point, I'm at a body fat that's not productive. Like it's not productive to keep pushing weight up because eventually I'm going to get to a point where it's like you are too fat. Like it is, it is just not. Insulin sensitivity. Totally. Yeah. And then when you consider, okay, well, are you able to start this phase giving yourself enough runway? So for me, I started my intentional growth at 130, maxed out at like 143, 144, cut back down to like 133. That would be appropriate to now push up again. Do I need to get to 145? No, not really. And past that point, it's just, I can do it. It's just not a lot. I mean, like, yes, it will be happening, but some of that weight gain is going to be body fat. Uh, I'd rather rinse, wash, repeat. I feel like, um, the more intentional you can be week to week. And I mean, that really just comes down to adherence. So for me that whatever, like 12, 13 pound, uh, gain that happened over the course of four months. So it was really, really gradual. Um, some people mentally, they don't have the fortitude to commit to that amount of weight coming on. And I, I think as coaches, like you have to respect that. You'd be like, I'm not going to just tell you, oh, suck it up. Like that's not how you get someone to have buy-in. And if it's their first time, like the only way you get someone mm-hmm to want to do something is to convince them, okay, I want to do this. It's not just telling them do Mm -hmm. this. That's not compliance. They're just avoiding any kind of negative repercussion. Yeah. Um, I've had a, (laughs) try not to put anyone on blast. Um, trying to be very political and respectful here, but I do know, um, some friends that have had coaches that, um, will literally just, uh, do exactly that. Just Mm -hmm. like fucking suck it up. 
Like, this is what you need to do. And it's insane because I've seen them, like, say that one person decided to, like, they got more steps in the day because they decided to go out with friends or something. Didn't drink or anything, stay on diet, whatever. Like, that person is punished with more cardio. And I'm like, that's literally the exact opposite of what you should be doing. Um, I've seen, I've seen like, coaches that have uh, pushed someone harder at the end of prep when they're not losing instead of thinking or at least being considerate of the person's like maybe cortisol levels or how much cardio they're doing overall that's like preventing them from losing weight and i mean this honestly just causes and induces more stress in the person and normally they end up coming to the show being like watery or just not being as lean as they projected themselves to be or they look better six weeks out um and i have another coat or another <laughs> boy that um I'm sorry if you're watching this, bro. Uh, I have another buddy that um, he's, his coach is like putting him on the cut and uh, he's uh, having him, he's trying to force him to take MK for the cut. And I'm like, that's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. This guy is suffering. He's fucking hungry and he's like doing a lot of cardio. And I'm like, bro, that's going to literally, that's going to make your life a nightmare. And oh. So I don't know. There's a lot. I just hope that like, I know there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are interested in bodybuilding or they have a huge passion. There's also a lot of people that are natural that just like love listening to the PED talk, which is fucking sick. But um, I just hope that anyone that's interested in like really delving deep into bodybuilding and competing that hasn't like really takes your time with finding a good coach and realizing like I think empathy is probably one of the most important things that you should look for. Totally. Um, I feel like when I got into talking about PEDs, a lot of people assume coming to me, they're like, oh, Corey's going to just, you know, she's, she's gatekeeping. She'll give me the cycle. She'll give me the dose and duration. And I find, I think what it's turned into is I'm like a walking dare program. Like I'm just talking people out of PEDs. I'm like, <laughs> no, don't do it. Like you're doing so much shit wrong already. Like let's <laughs> fix that first. Yeah. And it comes from a place of compassion. Cause it's like, Hey, if we don't fix this, it's not going to really matter. You'll get progress. You will, but we're still going to have this mess in the background that eventually we should correct. Like, I mean, just mm -hmm. like it's, it's the right way to go about it. Like if we're trying to do whatever it takes, all these stones that we're trying to turn, uh, those stones need to come before the PEDs. The PEDs are the easy part. And if we nail everything else, I mean, even appealing to logic, then it's like you want to do things generally safely. Even people who want to take like a higher risk approach, it's like, okay, but you don't want to be totally reckless. Right. So with that, like, get your affairs in order in terms of like your training, your diet, your timeline too. That's another thing with mentioning like the people who are at the end of prep and they're struggling to, to lose weight. And therefore we're having to take these extreme measures. That's avoidable. That's avoidable with some easy, like we're talking like grade school math planning, but the fact is a lot of coaches, they're not taking the time to do that. And I mean, to be fair, like athletes, like you can see if you have 20, 25 pounds to lose, you think you're going to lose that in three months? Like literally do do the math. It's simple. It's like, okay, a 500 calorie deficit a day, it's a pound a week. Mm -hmm. A thousand calorie deficit a day, even for a male, even a bigger male, that's a big commitment. And you commit to doing that every day perfectly for three months. It doesn't make you hardcore. It just makes you kind of stupid. It's like, you're going to end up running yourself into the ground, mm -hmm. having to take extremes towards the end, which frankly, if you planned a little better on the front end, it's not to say that it's not, it will suck getting that lean, getting that lean just won't feel good, mm -hmm. but avoid taking those extremes by doing the work when it's easier, when you're fatter, don't wait till the end of prep to start digging and like really turning it up. And frankly, the inclusion of PEDs that can augment something that's already occurring, but it's not going to create a, more of a deficit for you unless you're already in a deficit. So, mm -hmm. I mean, drug selection, being cognizant of what the drug actually does, doesn't make sense to have it in, in a fat loss phase or building phase. Um, it doesn't make sense based on the trajectory of where you're going. You know, you're trying to get on stage, but you're like, okay, well, you can get as lean as you want, but frankly, you don't have the muscle. Is this time the next four months, is it better spent building? Well, for most people, the answer is probably yes. So for the athletes who are listening to this or competitors, non-competitors who are like, I hear you, but I want to take the drugs. It's like, okay, let's make it make sense. Let's do the things that are going to actually result in you having a better physique, not just include them because you're excited to include them. Mm -hmm. um, what are the worst things you've seen in coaching? Using drugs to compensate for terrible planning, terrible mm. program design. 
I would say, I would say that's the worst. Um, I mean, like I, I've seen the cycles that, I mean, just like inversely you have the MK and then semaglutide on the same plan. And it's like, what are we doing? Like, <laughs> you know, make you hungry. That's and insane. yeah, it's like, um, I think a lot of coaches will kind of stick to, well, this is how it's done or this is what this pro athlete or Olympian does. So I'm going to do it too. Um, I think not getting people lean enough, I think as a coach, that's like your number one job. Like, no, in a prep, like we're not going to be able to do a ton from a muscle building perspective. We can protect muscle. We can prevent muscle loss. Mm -hmm. But like the number one thing is like get the athlete lean and you should be able to do that with a reasonable amount of time. And if you're not willing to have the hard conversation at the beginning of prep, like, hey, you're too fat. Like you are. This is going to be excessive. What we should do is really do a mini cut a holding phase and then consider if prep still makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think those hard conversations are oftentimes, um, the culprit for a lot of these problems, a lot of these extremes that are then taken. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you feel like any of the medications that we spoke about today may benefit you, such as BPC 157, GH acutagogues such as tessamorelin, IGF-1, oxandrolone troche, semaglutide, then you can obtain these from trans and HRT and the link for that will be in the bio. If you feel like you're experiencing symptoms of low testosterone, such as depression, anxiety, lack of motivation, as well as lack of sex drive, then you can get this checked out as well by getting your blood work done at Transcend, and they will provide you expert medical analysis. Transcend HRT has worked with many professional bodybuilders and pro athletes, such as Thor Bjornsson, Phil Heath, and Jeremy Buendia. And if you feel like this podcast has any relevancy to you, I do believe that this clinic will provide of great benefit to you as well. I don't know if this is a guy thing, but I can only have so many things in my mind at once. And by so many, I only one thing. <laughs> so, see, I'm talking to someone and then I'm also like at the cupboard putting like CBD in my mouth and then also trying to make a mixed drink. I'm going to forget something. Oh, behind. I'm the worst. Like I can't, I can't be on my phone. Like I, some people like can text and like, I'm like, I, it's too stimulating. There's too many things. Everyone shut up. Like, <laughs> there's so much going on right now. People are like, you're so focused. I'm like, yeah, I can't because my brain won't otherwise. <laughs> like, my brain won't. Otherwise. I don't know how to do the two things at once. My biggest issue is like hanging out with somebody or like a friend or something. I'm driving them somewhere. <laughs> I don't know why. I just can't have a conversation. I can't. Oh my gosh. I bet that drives people crazy. You're like, yeah. you're, you're just like, listen, do you want to get here or do you just want to drive around for <laughs> 40 minutes? Because it's one or the other. There's yeah. no in between. I feel bad because I just sound like I don't give a fuck about their about the conversation. I think it's really good communication. I would like if someone told me that I'd be like, oh, thank God. I, okay. Now I know. Like, I'm going to keep saying this. Then. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I feel like it's my thing. By the way, total random question. But yeah. um, how do you feel like uh, this path in bodybuilding has affected your relationships? Like intimate relationships or just friendships or both? Yeah. It's a great question. So I just got out of a five year relationship oh, um, wow. yeah, about six months ago. Um, the individual, he was not into bodybuilding. Mm. I think it's hard. Like I imagine like with what you do with girls, like it's, it's a lot to ask them to not be insecure um, because of the attention, but at the same time, it's also like, it shouldn't really change. Like sure there's more frequency and opportunity but it is a part of what you do mm -hmm. i see it like is like you're gonna get messages you're going to get more attention you're gonna get people that are very interested in and in you or i for how you look cool but it still comes down to like the communication um yeah i yeah. don't know i don't feel like i answered that well at all no i think that was really good okay yeah <laughs> cool um what about you i think that was helpful at least it it, it i feel like i related to it personally okay. um I do. Yeah. Obviously confidence is attractive. It's something that I find attractive in, in women as well. Um, because I think it also gives me this level of feeling accepted. Uh, cause if they have the confidence in themselves enough to not be scared or controlling around things that I do, it makes me feel more accepted into their lives yeah. as being who I am doing the things that I'm passionate about. And I think like that, that like acceptance or, um, at least anything that kind of resembles like an unconditional uh, love or an unconditional affection is like fucking so attractive. Yeah. You know, so. 
I think there's something romantic. I kind of feel this way about marriage and stuff. It's like there's something really romantic about someone who has a lot of opportunity, but is actively choosing to be monogamous or be committed in whatever committed that is, whether that's marriage, monogamy, exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think when you have a choice not to, I think it means more versus having someone who instills like boundaries, parameters, rules on like, okay, well, you can't follow these people. That's like a super easy one, but like you can't follow these people. You can't talk to girls who are super attractive. It's like, well, now you're just putting these things in because you assume if I had the opportunity, I would choose to pursue them. Like you're always giving up pursuit or loyalty. And I think someone who isn't actively trying to force loyalty, they just accept whether you give it or not. And trust. To me, that's really attractive. Yeah. yeah super attractive for sure. Um, and I feel like obviously... I think for a lot of us, it can feel hard to find, but I think that's also a very difficult place to be where you choose and why it's also so beautiful because in like places like such an LA, you know, such as in LA, a lot of people feel like there's a lot more options out there, which I understand. Like there's a, there's so many people and, and I feel like in LA more than any place I've ever lived in my entire life, it's so much easier to meet so many people just within like a week span of time. Yeah. Like I can't even fathom just how many, how many people I've met over the course of the last year living in LA. It's crazy. So, which is cool. But, um, yeah, I've noticed that, the uh, it is hard to like, I think it's, it's hard to make those choices, but it's also that that's why it's so beautiful when you do. And it's that powerful when you decide to choose one person. Yeah, no, I agree. Do you feel, are you, you're in a relationship, right? Do you have a, um, I don't talk much about my stuff right now because <laughs> I've talked to, I've, I've been very open about the, the stuff, but my like relationship life and everything in the past. Cause I was in like this four year open relationship situation, mm-hmm. which honestly was the greatest teacher I've ever had because, um, um, I think I, I did, I, I feel like I was always like a jealous person and, um, mm-hmm. obviously an open relationship is a crazy container to be in if you're a jealous person. Yeah. So, um, I think I just wanted to, experience it, put, put myself in a place that's hard, learn how to like accept and like love regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, and somehow I know that there's a lot of a uh, stigma against it. And there's a lot of men that are kind of disgusted by the idea of open relationships, which I totally understand. Like, it's not something I want to end up with. Like I want a monogamous container and like I want a wife and kids, but, um, it really allowed me to like, truly feel passion and see radical novelty every day and realize Mm -hmm. that this is something I need to implement into my monogamous relationship. Continuously implement radical novelty every day by like bringing them out on dates, Mm. acting, you know, acting in a place where this person truly is like my queen Um, and uh, continuously creating that like relationship for the rest of time. Yeah. Because that's, that's all we have. And, I think, yeah, I think novelty, um, it's a construct and if it can go away, it can also be created. And that's Mm -hmm. where I think a lot of people, they, they give over ownership. They're like, oh yeah. Like, you know, it just faded. It's like, well, didn't have to, that was kind of active. Like there was choice in letting it fade. Right. So couldn't, couldn't you bring it back? Um, I love that. You can definitely bring it back for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I found I found that uh, in the last year I, I have a lot more power over my mind than I thought. Mm-hmm. I actually realized that I even have the power to like. It's mm-hmm. it's really weird. It's really weird. This isn't something I've talked about, and I don't think I really know how to vocalize it right now. But I feel like I've noticed that I've had the power to 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 like who I want to like now, in a mm-hmm. way, by realizing like like truly understanding, like enlisting like what is good about this relationship for me you know what do i love about it how do i see this benefiting me and me benefiting this person you know um does this make me want to be a better person but there's just so many things there's like fucking thousand questions i can ask myself but by literally like sitting in it meditating in this and like realizing like whether this is good for me or not or say like say like um in one relationship, like games are being played. And like, even though I thought it was amazing and like everything I wanted at first, realizing that this is a pattern that's consistent, like I, I can literally sit in it and make myself feel less attracted easily. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. it's being, kind of 
cool to know that now that I can, I, knowing that I can do that so easily now, I almost just, it's, it almost takes me two weeks. Like if I decide that this is not worth it, I'm going to feel sad for two weeks. But when two weeks is over, like I feel pretty over it. Um, so I realized, you know, I can do that in my relationship too. Like I can continue to choose to keep it going on forever if I want to. I think, you know, you touched on something really, really good there. Uh, being very clear about what you want and not letting things like not seeing any kind of relationship as just black and white. Um, they're like, I think they're really amazing connections that can be just that they can be amazing connections. They can be beautiful and they can be very special. But then when you assess like compatibility from a relationship standpoint, like cohabitating, you can be like, okay, this person doesn't meet my needs and that's okay. It doesn't make the connection any less beautiful, but from mm -hmm. a compatibility standpoint, this isn't going to be something that is likely favorable for either party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like, hard for people to do when you're just fucking like when you feel like you're just in love and yeah you're just fucking oh i fucking need this <laughs> yeah no it's um it's interesting yeah going going from the relationship i was in um that was the first time that i was like i am completely okay being single and like i actually i do not want to seek any kind of any kind of partnership I don't want to chase anything. I, I want to, um, I don't know. I just want to reflect and get really clear about what I want before putting someone else in the mix, you know? Um, yeah. Um, I think the reason that one of the reasons why I asked that question is actually, this is a little bit probably more related or, um, I guess, um, apparent for the male side, but after inducing myself or after going through a journey of, using PEDs and it affecting my mental health in really bad ways and then trying to figure out how to fix that and then figuring out how to manage my hormones and balance them out and then figuring out how to make myself feel good through doing the process, I think I've realized it become like bounds more mindful over my mm -hmm. body and over um, my state. And I think that's been extremely helpful for me in all my relationships. Um, I remember there's a few times in my past relationship where I would act out and I would like be very selfish or I'd be very, very irritable. I found out like, for example, one example was like, I was very irritable because I realized that I was uh, on more Mastron that I should have been compared to like the amount of tests I was on. My estrogen was crashed. So, you know, severe dehydration, obviously this is affecting my um, bone mass, but that's that I can't tell. But for sure, I'm like, just, I feel like absolute dog shit and irritable all the time. And, um, that's like one tiny thing that I think is really important for me to stay conscious of throughout this entire process. And I think in doing so too, whether or not it's just the mindfulness or it's also from just taking them over the course of like a couple of years or so, uh, I feel a lot more tolerant. Like I feel like the substances don't affect me nearly as much. Um, if not almost at all when it comes mm -hmm. to my mind, um, my mental state, my emotions. And, um, it's just, it feels good to be able to be mindful over it. Absolutely. I mean, would, I guess, let me follow up with, would you say that that same, uh, Logic can be applied to individuals who maybe haven't gone through a, like a prep experience and like gotten as lean as you've gotten yeah. for show. Um, because I think a lot of times like people yeah. have that belief around like, oh, getting that lean. OK, um, regardless of, you know, me putting myself in this environment it is almost like an excuse to behave however you want to behave, to let your emotions mm -hmm. dictate those behaviors and how it affects other people. And it's like, well, if you live in a bubble, cool. And no one's affected by it. Fine. But I don't know. I do. You, do you feel like um, some people they they kind of use that as a scapegoat as well, just for for getting lean, the hunger, the discomfort they experience. What do you mean by a scapegoat? They um, use that. They use like, okay, well, I'm doing this really hard thing, so I'm allowed to act mm. however I want to act. Yeah, I think a lot of people may, but I don't think that it's. I think most of the time it's not intentional. Mm. You know, I think people will just act out but not really be aware mm -hmm. of how they could be acting differently. Or even if they are, they're not sure why it is. Maybe they think it just is. Because I think sometimes <sighs> what I've realized, if I try to tell you what I felt like two days ago, I couldn't. 
I literally, it's really hard for me to tell you, like, I felt amazing two days ago, or honestly, I was fucking exhausted two days ago, unless I wrote it in my notes, or it was something substantial on a day, like, I did, like, a massive speaking thing, or a podcast, then I could tell you that. Otherwise, that shit skips my mind, right? So, I think same thing for, like, if you wake up and one day you feel like dog shit, maybe you felt like dog shit that entire week, maybe it's something you know, but I think a lot of people aren't so aware, often where they will be like, hey, like I just started taking this substance to like like their loved one or something. And I think maybe it might be affecting the way that I feel about certain things. So I just wanted to let you know about that. I don't think that happen, happens too often. Yeah. Um, and I think going through these processes too and like feeling how I felt when my emotions and my hormones weren't balanced or stable, I think honestly has made it a lot easier for me to like empathize with people that are in similar states or like even empathize with like my partners or other women who like when say that they're like PMSing or having um, hormonal issues, it's made it a lot easier for me to communicate with them. Um, so it's kind of cool, honestly. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if anyone's, <laughs> I don't know if everyone's going to experience that. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like it's given you um, a different perspective and made you um, more aware, even relative to your partner's emotions as they might fluctuate in a manner that's out of their control. And I mean, like, even though we're talking about uh, the control of like putting these drugs in place, taking them out and the expected outcomes on your emotions there, it's still to a large degree out of your control. You don't know the magnitude at which it's going to affect mm -hmm. um, the state that you're in. And I mean, like, I think it's incredible that you've made that, you know, a conscious choice or you're actively trying to make it a choice to um, at least it, it, at least be aware of those fluctuations as it relates to the phase that you're in. All right. I want to ask these questions. All right. We got some good ones. Yeah. A lot of bodybuilding related, of course. Um, Johnny asks, uh, what are your thoughts on Ozempic? I think there's a strong argument for it potentially to be used post-show. If you're looking at someone who, um, were to use like a very low dose with the intention, okay, you know, body fat is going to go up. That's the goal. Um, but to slow that progression in which we regain body fat while hormonal balance is being restored, I think that like six to eight week period post show um, weight gain must occur. Like, I mean, you need to get out of that like stage lane that that prepped state. Mm -hmm. um, how uh, much? How much weight did you say? Uh, I, I didn't give a value, but I mean, oh, like, sorry. Um, or did you say weeks? Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. That six to eight week period okay, yeah. post show. Like, I mean, six weeks. I mean, like your body fat should go up. And yeah, we would. It would be great if hormones um, were directly, linearly correlated with that weight gain. They're just not. And on the female mm -hmm. side, I mean, like it could very well take like three, four months before um, you're re-regulated, before you're seeing any kind of ovulation occur. So, I think there's an argument for it to be made. I wouldn't say it's first line or something that I'm going to necessarily have in place for all clients. But if I know that someone is really struggling post-show and we want to slow that progression of weight gain, I mean, theoretically we could put it in place. Um, there's people who I know actively they're using it throughout their preps. Um, I, I, I don't feel like ethically uh, I'm in a position to be like, oh, that's right or wrong. But I do think it's interesting how the same people who are like, okay, here's a framework for using drugs. They really don't like people using Ozempic in a contest prep. And it's like, hmm. I think when we're talking about um, picking and choosing, like we should be following principles based approach. And if you're looking at the risk associated with those MPIC, it's like, how can we justify something uh, like, like, how can we justify something like trend versus those MPIC? So, I mean, I think again, like our decision-making around these compounds needs to be very clear. And oftentimes people who have issues with it, mm -hmm. I don't think they're very clear on why certain things are justified and why they're not. Okay. Um, what do you think they do have issues with it? I think they see it as cheating. I think they see like putting mm -hmm. it in place is like, oh, you're taking out the sock of prep and like, I mean, sure, but isn't what we're doing in terms of, like fat burners, isn't that doing the same thing? It's like we're making yeah. the prep easier. So same concept yeah. with people who are like, oh, what is natural? Am I a natural athlete? Am I an enhanced athlete? It's like, 
we can get really nuanced and be like, are you taking creatine? Are you taking pre-workout? Are you taking caffeine? Because those are all going to enhance your ability to do more of whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yes, some drugs are going to work differently, work on different pathways. But at the end of the day, um, I think that needs to be an individual's choice. Like I, I wouldn't feel... I don't feel like it's something I'm strongly opposed to for certain individuals, but we also know like these things can get out of hand. And do I see like there being a push where it's commonly used in our sport? Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. There's someone asked the same question I asked, uh, but we don't have to talk about it now, but it was a whoa, whoa asked how has being a female bodybuilder affected your relationships? I can give a better answer to that. Okay. Um, Yes. Yeah. I think it's something that being in the sport where there's such a heavy emphasis on your physique, um, definitely can be challenging, but for one, if the communication is solid, which I mean, like the communication should be solid, whether you're in the sport or not, um, that is going to predicate to the degree that being in a physique related sport where you're getting a lot of attention, it's going to predicate whether or not, um, how, I guess how big of an issue that actually poses, like we were talking about. I mean, the frequency in which you receive attention that really shouldn't, um, that shouldn't be a factor. Yet it is. I mean, like I mm-hmm. do try to empathize with, uh, you know, guys I've dated in the past. Like it's a lot. It's a lot. That, like I got, got hit on this morning at nine a.m. Like I get my FedEx <laughs> guys. I'm like <laughs> fucking serious right now. Like I mean, um, it's frequency and volume might make it more challenging, but we can also look at it like opportunities. And if you trust your partner, I really think at the end of the day, that should determine your reaction. Yeah. Um, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dope. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Miss Michelle asks TRT versus peptides versus HGH versus anabolics for a 49 year old figure athlete. Question mark. All right. Um, TRT as indicated, if your levels are not supported, that's your starting point because everything we do in a contest prep in an extreme fat loss phase is going to cause suppressive effects on all of your hormones. Mm. So uh, TRT, that needs to be in place. Um, GH, I'm a big fan. I prefer that over like any kind of GHRPs, so peptides, mm. ipamorelin, cimarelin. I just think when we're looking at the price point, you can source UGL, GH for a lower cost. Um, just be wary of that is that if... Um, you're looking at something like morelin, uh, it's not, it, it is a less direct path. Whereas like we're talking about GH, you're just putting GH in the body. Yep. It's more specific. I would prefer that route. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the other one? Anabolics as needed. So for building, if you're in figure, it's very likely you're going to be using those in, in a contest prep, but using them truly as needed. And then what was the other one? There's a fourth one, I think too. Peptides. Okay. Peptides. Um, depending on the kind of peptide, I mean like, some sure there's an argument for, I uh, I'm not a big fan of like just indefinitely saying, okay, what peptides are available? Let's put them all in. Cool. I think really there needs to be a need. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when I think of, well, actually there's so many more, but I mean, whenever I think of peptides that are maybe related to some kind of prep, I normally just, I think GH secretagogues come to mind first for me. Um, I don't think everybody really always needs the use of something like PPC or TB500, but what are your, I guess, thoughts or opinions on those peptides on BPC and TB? Okay. So BPC uh, is going to work on avascular tissue. So if you don't have an avascular injury, I wouldn't just put it in place. Um, Mm -hmm. So it does something very similar to growth hormone. It creates, uh, it stimulates the production of VEGF, but ultimately if you have someone who has any kind of um, potential risk of, of cancer, if they themselves have had any kind of suspicion of cancer, if there's not an indication, like if you don't have an actual injury, um, I don't think it makes sense to have BPC in place. TV is actually going to work on like dynamic tissue, so muscle. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, being very clear about like, why are we using these things? Just having them in isn't going to result in a lot. Um, and then when you look at the consideration around like these are... Uh, these are peptides that are going to stimulate repair, so cellular growth. Um, so same rule of thumb if you're using GH. If you or someone like directly in your family has high risk of cancer, it's a consideration to make, uh, especially if you're going to have them in, uh, in place long term. RZ Will 8 asks, how do you get your spouse into fitness? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, 
I guess it depends. Are you trying to get them into like, what's the, um, what's the reason? What's, why do you want them into fitness? Do you want to go to the gym with them? Do you want them to take better care of themselves? Because two different answers. I mean, I think, I think that's something you need to be really sensitive about in general. Mm -hmm. If it's something that's coming from like, Hey, maybe they are gaining a little bit of weight. Uh, maybe they're not taking care of themselves, but it's the same kind of rationale as like, if you have someone who's not taking care of their mental health, like how would you support them in actively seeking, um, I don't know, improvements in overall well-being? You should probably take care of your mental health. <laughs> For sure. I mean, like, and I think conversation is I'm like... Sorry, I was making a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> Reminded me of my friend telling me that I need to take care of my mental health when I when I had like a five testosterone. Oh, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, you should probably just try not to be depressed. <laughs> you, should, uh, you should just want your hormones to be better. (laughs) Um, you know, you know, the shitty part is like in medicine. So like in nursing school, HRT is like not a thing for women. They're just like, uh, stress less, eat more, sleep more. It's like not, Hey, let's support these hormones, like through nutrition, through exogenous support. When someone's going through menopause, they're just like, no, no, that's a dangerous. Let's, let's just, uh, all lifestyle modifications, but it's like, wait, so we're doing nothing. Like this person's not going to turn back on, but we're just going to tell them to fix it. Like how? Hmm. Yeah. It's weird. I'm sure in time that that's going to adjust slowly, but I just, I do hate how like things just move so slowly sometimes because people just don't want to, they don't want to take a dip in like the pond of like using something that feels even remotely untraditional or unnatural. Even just like thinking about weed in California, like I can't believe like we had dare back then and that was just like the worst thing that you could possibly take. And now this entire state is legal. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 Fit mom, fit, uh, fit mom of boys, 1611. She said, uh, I'm glad I found your profile. Love the topics and how real you are. Sick. Thank you. Appreciate it. Fit mom of fit boys, fit boys or just boys. <laughs> fit mom of boys. Okay. Soon to be fit boys. As we get older, <laughs> probably. And then she asks, um, is it possible to do just one cycle of VAR when starting and then keep going without it? Sure. I mean, like that is the approach globally I would take is like, if you don't need it, you don't, you shouldn't continue taking it. Um, now the argument I would make though, is that like, you're only going to have it in place six to eight weeks, like for a female athlete. Well, in that case, how much muscle realistically are you going to build? Mm-hmm. Even for a newbie, it's not going to be significant. So if you're using it to facilitate growth, I would say it's most important prior to that, prior to starting that Mm -hmm. cycle, that you have a program that is going to yield growth. If you don't have that, you can put it in place. Weight's going to go up immediately. It's probably also going to come off as soon as you take the drug out. Um, Ensuring that you know how to build muscle without the drugs is paramount. Mm -hmm. Um, I might be going into too too deep, so you don't have to be too descriptive especially if it's like regarding your programming or your personal programming but um for guys for example when we're doing like an off season uh for bodybuilding uh there's a lot that goes into like our growth phase right facilitating growth because you know say that you're on like i think the standard for a lot of guys if they're competing for the pro stage they'll say something along the lines of like at least like 500 milligrams of tests on like a standard dose and then obviously you want something to like mitigate the uh, excess estrogen. So if it's not an AI, something like Primo and then whatever, et cetera. And then I'll talk about like cycling that. But like for women, of course, especially if you're like in something like bikini, I feel like um, there's so much you want to avoid. You know, you want to like, like just, I don't know, like 2.5 to 5 milligrams of Anavar for like six weeks just sounds like such a small time and a small dose for how long someone needs to book for, like say that they're booking for a year. So I guess, what have you seen in terms of like um, uh, growth phase programming? Yeah, yeah. I mean, on that, um, we want to try to get as much growth as we can Mm -hmm. prior to the inclusion. Now, realistically, it's going to depend on how much runway the athlete actually has. Um, If we can put on a couple pounds without the anabolic, um, over the course of, I mean, like, let's say, let's say four to five months, like one to two pounds of tissue. That's amazing. And when you think about someone who's like, I'm, I'm 130 pounds, like you put on one to two pounds of tissue in the right areas, 
that's going to be substantial uh, next time they get on stage. If it's, you know, like if they aren't trying to go like wellness or figure, yeah. um, you put in the anabolic. Okay. You can get a little bit faster growth, but realistically it's, we're not talking about like five, 10 pounds, maybe, maybe five pounds scale weight, but the actual P ratio, like the fat to muscle, mm-hmm. um, there's going to be some fat gain, but we want it to be quality weight that's increasing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where we lean on those other metrics to show that uh, the weight that's coming on is favorable. It's not just fat. Um, you can be more aggressive with it. And I've had clients where we'll do that cycle. We'll come off. Okay. What other tools do we have? Uh, do we have the ability to keep pushing up food? Because ultimately, what do we need to build muscle? Well, we need a stimulus. So we need training in place that supports muscle growth. We need to be seeing that performance is going up considerably over a certain amount of time. Um, we need food to support it. We need sleep, uh, hydration. These are all things like, okay, checking these boxes, cool. Um, we should be able to still yield muscle growth even after that very short, very mild conservative cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, but then if we're getting to a point where we have a prep coming up, so like, okay, we're rounding out, getting to the tail end of the bulk. We want to get ready for a show again. Maybe it does make sense to do another cycle. Um, my emphasis is really to ensure that the anabolic isn't in place Um indefinitely and in for an extensive period of time because yeah. the longer that you're exposed to that anabolic for female athletes the higher chance of virilization so truly as needed in that case gotcha um do you increase calories when uh, a female jumps on a cycle yeah yeah i would say generally i mean like they should have a significant increase in training performance um we should be able to push food up mm-hmm. if it's someone that we're not seeing that performance go up once sanivar is in place or it's going up but it's not significant um yeah food definitely would be indicated elna declerk asks where would you draw the line for body fat percentage as a natural athlete in a growing phase i don't i don't love like hard lines in body fat Mm -hmm. um but i would say like i mean whatever weight that is so like for me I've competed previously at like a little under 125. Um, I know right now to be like stage lean, it would be about 125, 127, um, really 20 pounds past that. I mean, like, yes, granted, if you're talking about over the course of a long period of time and you've built some muscle, okay, maybe it's 20 pounds past what your leanest was or your stage weight was, assuming you were stage lean plus whatever pounds we assume you built, um, 25 Mm, okay, that's starting to get into that non-productive mm-hmm. area. 30 pounds, it's just really hard for me to believe that it's quality tissue or it's quality weight at that point. Yep. Um, and I think then there's a better argument to bring weight down, do a mini cut, chip off as much weight as you can. And in that case, it's only a mini cut of like six, seven weeks. I mean, we're not talking about a full prep. So it's like you can be pretty aggressive during that time. That'll ultimately set you up to at least build more runway for the next time you you go ahead and push. What would you say that's uh, about the same for men or do you have a different? Oh, that's tough. I mean, how does, okay. So being in your position, how does that sound when I'm talking about like, Mm -hmm. like what would be that threshold for you that you're like, I mean, is it 40 pounds? Like, I guess for men, obviously just depending on your size, you know, as you're bigger and bigger and bigger then you would probably expect your weight to go up more. So, I mean, uh, for me, I would probably think closer to 30, but uh, I, I did 20 pounds through this bulk, so I'm hoping it's enough. 20 pounds on the, over the course of a year. We kept it pretty lean. Um, but I have heard some other men, especially the ones that are bigger, will like go even higher than that, higher than 30. So it's a hard call. <laughs> it, it really is. depends per person. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like someone who's doing really well, and we can see it on their composition, we see mm-hmm. that like they're not looking excessively fatter. I'm yeah. like... I'm I'm less inclined to pull weight down or to give them anxiety around it. Um, I'd rather have them if they're in a good groove. Okay, well, let's continue to push up still with the idea that like, okay, how much body fat are we going to have to lose the next time we go into a prep? Because once that number becomes too great, that's when we're going to run into problems. I would say maybe the better way to answer this is like how far away from stage weight do you want to be starting your prep? Mm -hmm. And I would say for someone around my size, like 20 pounds is really the max I've started at 25 pounds. I mean, it adds an additional several weeks to dieting. Um, Ultimately, the amount of time you're spending dieting, uh, fatigue is going to accumulate. Dietary fatigue, training fatigue, 
you don't want to put yourself in a position where now the total amount of time spent dieting is exceeding like 30 weeks. So even at a 1% rate of loss, that's still a long time in a fat loss phase and getting to that body fat percentage that you have to get down to for show. It's like, you don't want to drag that out. Like it shouldn't be like yeah. a marathon to get there. Yeah, I agree. And normally, at least for me, if I'm doing like a really, really long bulk, well, hopefully in, you know, um, include at least like one small mini cut phase or a couple small ones to just keep it under wraps. DS Pearls asks, when to start competing? Is it something for everyone? Question mark. Your facial expressions reading these are so funny. You're killing me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, I can see like you're taking them. Um, okay. When, I guess, when to start competing? Um, best case scenario, you compete once you've gone through some kind of building phase to begin with. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend someone just enter a prep in cold. Like, oh, okay, I just, I want to get on stage. Cool. So let's start a contest prep. I think there are a lot of uh, changes that are going to occur from a lifestyle standpoint, and you're likely not aware of what it's going to take. Um, the logistics of it, of even just like, just being able to execute a prep start to finish, um, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot. And I think for most people, they would benefit from having even like a pre prep phase where we identify, okay, what is this individual's, this athlete's weaknesses from an execution standpoint? Um, if it's an adherence thing, like with the diet, okay, now we have this intentional phase where we're working on correcting that behavior. If it's a training thing, they're like just their training sucks. They're not very good at con uh, consistently producing the same results. Okay, let's identify that. If it's someone who we find, okay, they can cut really easily and they don't struggle with that, but keeping that weight on, like they, they just are prone to losing muscle. Okay, that pre-prep phase will set us up and ultimately identify what areas we need to pay close attention to once we're in that prep. Do you need to compete? Absolutely not. Like, I mean, I, I think a lot of people, they get... Um, very consumed with like the ceremonial process of actually like winning and uh, doing well on stage. And I mean, it, your, your first set of shows, like, I mean, how, how did you do? Like, um, first show I got third place. Cause, um, I decided I was not, I didn't have enough money for a tan. So I bought my own tan cause I was in college and uh, put it on myself and then I showered and then went on stage and I was orange. So, <laughs> He told me uh, I definitely would have gotten at least a little bit better of a placement if I got a normal freaking tan. Oh my God. That's amazing. Yeah. Could have gotten second place. Damn. But third place, your first show. That's yeah. amazing. That's great. Like, I mean, like you objectively did very well. I think a lot of people going into this, that's not going to be their experience. Like, I mean, their experience, they're probably going to place worse. Like just generally like the bell curve of this is, um, if you're able to go in and keep in mind, like, okay, what did you gain from the process of prepping versus what did I gain from placing a certain way actually on stage? I think that's going to be much more valuable. Um, having a really strong why, like, why do you want to get on stage? I mean, yeah, it can build confidence and it can make you do, it can force you to, you know, artificially you are in this uh, high stress state, it's self-imposed. But the fact is like, if you're doing it only to win, I think that's a much different why than doing it to be your best self. And you can't really control who else shows up. So yeah. ultimately it's like, do you want to place all of your value on what this panel of judges says um, when you're competing against people that have likely done it longer mm -hmm. than you? I mean, I don't think it's wise. Right. Yeah. I think it really depends on everyone's perspective over the competing as their decision maker. Um, B. Venturas asks, what are your thoughts on Ace... 31 ACE 031. I haven't ever really looked, looked into that. Um, and then, and inducing myostatin deficiency in female athletes. Ooh, pass. I was going to throw that one to you. I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, same. I'm going to look it up though. Now myostatin deficiencies. I wish we could just inject myostatin. Deficiencies. <laughs> <laughs> They're fucking huge. Uh, Tiger Lucian asks, how does the PCT process dif differ from women to men? It really depends on what was your baseline to begin with. So a lot of people, they get into, I mean, like most women are competing with shitty hormones to begin with. Like, I mean, the whole idea that like, oh, like, you know, you're competing, you're doing well uh, because their hormones are super balanced. They're optimized. It's like, uh, not really. Like there's a lot of women who find success in the sport being in a suboptimal state. Um, the state of prep itself will have suppressive effects on your sex hormones, on the HPA access too. So it's like, okay, 
if prior to competing, if you were anovulatory, meaning like you weren't seeing that rise and fall of estrogen and progesterone, it's unlikely that after coming off cycle or coming out of a show, enhancements or not, that you're going to see a restoration return easily. Mm-hmm. Um, the really the resilience is what's going to dictate what a PCT looks like. Uh, resilience is your abilities, your body's ability to handle that very high stress state. So I think about like I explain it this way. Um, growing up, like if you had parents who were super strict and they'd like ground you and like take away your keys, if you got like a B on an exam, be like, no, you're done, like shutting it down. It's kind of the same with your body's ability to like handle being in prep, being at low mm-hmm. calories, high cardio. Um, does your internal parent shut it down? Do they shut off fertility at a very early point in prep? Well, if that's the case, like you're going to have to be very patient post-show or post-cycle. Um, other parents are like, yo, like it's fine. Like whatever, like they kids get away with everything. It, yeah. it doesn't matter. There's no impact. And in that case, I would say that is resemblant of the athlete who's able to stay lean year round, uh, like very, very lean, who's able to compete often without it actually having an effect on their hormones. But bottom line, without that baseline, it's going to be really hard to uh, make that assumption or I guess like give give that assessment. Um, we would need that baseline. Okay. Do they have any tools that they can utilize? Um, supplements, you mean? Supplements. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like anything that's... Um, Anything that's going to increase like LH, um, FSH, I guess LH pulsatility. Um, if you wanted to use something to stimulate like progesterone, uh, there's definitely some over the counter options. Mm. Um, we do want estrogen to come back up. So, I mean, that's like ovulation is really the epitome of female health Mm -hmm. and it's not just a matter of getting your period. So, I mean, your listeners, they're going to love this. So I'll keep it brief. Uh, ovulation, if that's not occurring, that's not a good sign. If you're not ovulating prior to starting that cycle, it's very unlikely you're going to afterwards. Uh, Mm. Really, the thing that's going to move the needle the most outside of supplements is going to be not being in that contest prep or that fat loss state. I guess I'm wondering, uh, is there any, like, so for men, I think two, uh, two supplements, I guess, or two tools that stand out for, for men that most people use during PCT is like HCG and clomiphene or HCG and clomin or something along these lines. I'm just wondering if there's anything like that for a woman that does stand out in particular we to help. help. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so really like the biosynthesis of how, how these hormones are produced. Um, we would want to work further up that chain. So something like DHEA could mm-hmm. be helpful. Supplementing if, DHEA. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, boron would help increase free test, lower SHBG. Um, that could also help as well. Um, something in order to help the stimulation of progesterone, but really like the very top of the cascade is cholesterol. So the mm-hmm. people who are on like, let's say very low fat diets for extended periods of time, not good. Yeah. We don't want that. So, I mean, the inclusion of healthier fats, um, that could be in the form of supplementation if you're yeah. not getting that through your diet. So, um, that would be an option, but it really is going to come down to your body's ability to like where in the cascade, uh, there's a deficit. Nolan asks favorite way to splurge on off season. Ooh, I got one. Um, stuffed cookies. Do oh, you, stuffed. Do you know that's the brand? Yo, you oh, got to get on this. You post made it like, Oh, you're, are you dieting? <laughs> are you we're not doing this? Okay. Next off season. 13 more weeks. Sick. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll send you the link. Um, okay. the, yeah, no, my, my birthday last, last right. week we did uh, a charcuterie. Oh, happy board. birthday. The Thank fuck? You. <laughs> Thank you. We did a charcuterie board of these cookies, ordered like 10, like cut them up into eighths. I'm like, no, oh, you're yeah. going to experience this with me. Like, <laughs> these are so good. They're cookies inside of cookies. Like they're the most <laughs> extravagant thing ever. Um, I'm, gonna cry. I'm sorry. This is torture. Fuck? <laughs> uh, send me that link. I'm going to smell it through the phone. <laughs> Um, Kill Sicken asks, uh, dark secrets on the woman's side of competing. We know a little bit about the men's side. Hmm. Did you say dark? Yeah, you said dark secrets. Dark secrets? I feel like we already talked about a lot though. Yeah, I feel like we, we hit a lot of them. Um, yeah. okay, well, we'll come to that if I think of any other, other secrets that I'm gatekeeping. Okay. <laughs> Ethos asks, or Ethos says, I'm shy asking anything to her. <laughs> Don't be shy. I'm not intimidating. I talk, uh, yeah. I, talk I made sure endlessly. to pick your best picture for the story. Um, you did good. You did good. 
Colin asks, um, best way to beat mental fog during the final weeks of cutting? Mm, fatigue management, honestly. I mean, like time task audit of everything in your day that is draining you. And that can even be like conversations. I mean, like going through and seeing, okay, what is costing me the most energy and eliminating that to the best of your ability. Um, Rain Body Alchemy asks, can you achieve pro bikini body without steroids? I think we've discussed that. And then if so, how do you balance recovery? Mm, well, I mean, I think there are people who can definitely turn pro without drugs, but it comes down to it comes down to the level of competition. I mean, like there mm -hmm. are national shows where two pro cards are given out per division. Uh, the national show that I did, it was for, for the whole show. So, I mean, like you had to win your class, but then in the overall six, seven people won their classes and only the top four got pro cards. Mm. So, I mean, like being selective with the show that you're going to do, taking that into consideration realistically, the shows that more pro cards are given away, um, given away. I say that as if no one works. They're just like tossing them out. <laughs> terrible representation for the sport uh if you're going into those shows they're likely going to be more competitive um can you technically do it i mean sure but it is going to take a lot of time and it depends where you're starting from um and how patient you are facts um sometimes i'm just like should i maybe I'll ask go, it. go ahead Might as well. um same person rain body alchemy asks so what training slash recovery split do you recommend for a female bikini bodybuilder that's natural i mean so assuming that volume is appropriate per session, like I, I do think that three days a week of lower, it's feasible, but I mean, you're not going to get away with doing that at like 20, 25 working sets a workout. I mean, like, Oof. yeah, no, but I mean, like legit, that's what a lot of people are doing. They're like, it, there's, there are girls doing that at four days, four lower days a week. I'm like, what? Are, what? <laughs> like, those are not working sets. You're just in there for an active calorie burn. Like yeah. they're not quality. And right. what I found is, I do, I mean, my upper body's good. Like I don't need more upper body. So I do one upper body day a week. Um, granted in the case of someone who does need more upper body, I do think one or two sessions or one or two workouts, um, one that's focused on shoulders, maybe emphasis on rear delts as well on that second upper body day alongside lats. I think that'd be smart. Um, it really comes down to recoverability assuming that you understand RIR and like intensity and that you're mm -hmm. able to consistently produce um, high quality working sets, I think you can get away with the lower volume, mm -hmm. but it is predicated on that intensity being there and your program being designed well. Right. Yeah, I agree. And it's like drastically different for everybody. Uh, something I've said in podcast before is I actually got my, um, uh, I had, uh, got my raw data from 23andMe and put it into Prometheus so I could figure out all my genetic predispositions. And I found out that something that I actually already knew, but I wasn't sure, confirmed that um, I have this thing called impaired muscle performance, which basically means that um, I respond better to type, I have, I think I have more type one fibers or I respond better to like type one fiber training. So higher reps, longer time under tension, probably just more volume too in general. Versus like people that can power lift and move tons of weight. So, yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of cool because now, I mean, like I already felt that I could respond better to that, but I wasn't sure, you know. But knowing that now, it's like, I think that's a really, I think that's just like a really cool thing yeah. for people to know. Totally. Uh, really valuable too. I mean, like hypertrophy work, uh, enough volume will work at a certain point. But in that case, it's like ensuring that you are under a significant load for you know a reasonable amount of time mm -hmm. i think that's paramount like not just going in like okay i did the exercise it's like yeah but intensely like did you do them for the appropriate amount of reps sets are you doing the same modality i think these things they do matter yeah yeah for sure awesome i ask everybody one last question at the end of every podcast if you were to die tomorrow and you had one message you could send to the entire world what would it be leave people better than you find them nice <laughs> that's all good that. Yeah, I think that's one of my favorite ones so far. Oh, sick. Thanks. <laughs> I feel that one. Cool. Awesome. Where can everybody find you? Uh, Instagram, YouTube, Patreon at Corey, C-O-R-Y underscore F-I-T, Corey Fit. Um, interested in coaching. I am taking clients. Interested in one-time consults. I do that on a one-off basis. You're not locked into anything. I can do lab work, uh, drug work, timeline work. Uh, we can also just talk for an hour if you'd like. I can also do that so um thank you so much for having me on this yeah was thanks really for coming fun. on this was awesome this was really cool i think everyone will really love it and i did so everybody follow Corey. 
Patreon. And um, if you guys want to support the podcast, you can by rating us five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you find your podcast and subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking the bell button because that's what gets us these amazing guests like Corey today. So love you guys. See you guys next time. Peace. <laughs>